Hi and welcome to the second of this series of videos uh, which is using Martin Hunch's uh, paper on protocells to link to a number of fundamental biochemical concepts. Uh, we're going to have a little digression in this seg segment because we're going to talk about how we define life and also have a review of some of the important and interesting uh, milestones in prebiotic chemistry. So what is life? Um, a lot of the arguments I'm going to be using in this segment are taken from this book, which is available again in the Electronic Books Database, Ebury. Um, it's quite a complicated book. There's quite a lot of uh, sort of sophisticated chemistry in there. Um, it's well worth having a, a little look at if you're interested in this area. Maybe come back in a couple of years' time, uh, especially the chemists, uh, and read it again. Okay, so what does life need? Fundamentally, he needs a boundary, uh, a membrane. In this case, it's a single cell we see there, um, which separates it from the environment with which it can exchange materials. Uh, inside this boundary, it can perform metabolism. It can perform, uh, metabolism allows it to build structures, uh, metabolism associated with energy, and metabolism associated with heredity as well. Um, the systems have been developed by people like Hansch, are much less complicated than this. Um, Eventually, I guess somebody will put this whole thing together and we'll have artificial life. Now, so how do we define life? Um, this chap here with the splendid glasses is Alexander Oparin, who was a Russian biologist who produced a famous book in 1938, The Origin of Life, in which he listed six characteristics of life. Uh, first three on this page, and next three on the next page. Uh, you've almost certainly come across these um, when I did what was called all level biology. Uh, we covered these. And I'm sure if you've done GCSE and A-level biology, you'll cover them as well. Um, quite well quite well known characteristics. Um, it's fair to say that a number of people working on protocells have come up with cells that have some of these characteristics, uh, but nobody's yet brought them all together into a single system, uh, which may well then be considered as being the first evidence of artificial life. Okay, uh, in the book I mentioned earlier on, there's a... A report of uh, a thought experiment O'Paran did, uh, which is where he had an alien, uh, an alien either captured or beamed up by a farmer, and probed him. Uh, no, not that sort of probing, the intellectual kind of probing. Don't know what's the matter with you people? Uh, anyway, um, so yes, he, he gave the farmer a list. Um, he gave the farmer a list of various objects and things, which he asked the farmer to, to divide up into living things and non-living things. Now, I'm not quite sure where the alien came from, but he was uh, rather surprised by the farmer very quickly being able to designate, for example, flies and mushrooms and amoeba as being living, and uh, radio and robots and the moon as being non-living. Uh, the discussion continued uh, with the alien trying to elicit from the farmer the thought processes which went into his development of these lists. Uh, eventually, the alien sat down and he drew a diagram. Um, a number of things happen in this diagram. Uh, there's a substance which is designated S, which is some biological material essential for life. Um, if the system is isolated from its environment, it doesn't get the inputs of uh, new materials, S will ultimately decay to P, and the living system will, will cease to operate and will die. Um, okay, but on the other hand, if we have an input of a material A, a nutrient if you like, that can be metabolized to S, so the living system continues. Uh, that's an essential uh, that was done in the, defined in the 1930s. This this is a, the sort of approach many of the people looking at protocells are talking about. Uh, we look for a boundary of some sort of membrane in which we can perform a very simple metabolism, as we saw in the previous video, where the nitrobenzene uh, droplets were able to contain a metabolism to involve oleic anhydride being hydrolyzed to oleic acid. Uh, so after much consideration, the alien eventually came up with its definition of life, which is, which is quoted. I'm not, I'm not going to read it. Uh, read it yourself. Um, Parin noted that the farmer was nods, but he, he, he was doubtfully understood, which is a bit hard on the farmer, and not through this whole discussion, but then again, maybe not. Okay, here's a slightly more elaborated version of uh, Parin's system. In this case, we clearly have a, a membrane, uh, in which case which bounds the system from the outside and nutrients energy pass through it, uh, other materials uh, pass through it in the other direction. The reason we can't complicate the metabolism is taking place, and it includes DNA, 
um, for heredity and also RNA for the synthesis of proteins. Uh, there's also a number of organelles there, their own membranes. Um, in the case of things like mitochondria, uh, assumed to have been formerly in evolutionary history free living bacteria, uh, which have now been subsumed by a process called endosymbiosis. Um, so this is a modern biochemical system, quite complicated. Um, it's fair to say that the people working on protocells are some way away from producing anything with this level of complexity yet. Um, which leads us to a Parin's uh, continuity principle. The idea is this life does, can develop spontaneously. Uh, atoms certainly display self-organization. If you produce, uh, if you hydrolyze, I beg your pardon, if you electrolyze water, produce hydrogen and oxygen, uh, the hydrogen atoms will immediately come back to form hydrogen molecules and the oxygen atoms will immediately come back to form oxygen molecules because that's a more stable configuration. Uh, there's good evidence, as we've seen from space, that uh, quite a range of complicated molecules, including biomolecules, will form evidently spontaneously in non-biological conditions. Um, then we develop other levels of complexity, uh, producing macromolecules, and more complicated molecules, which contain metabolism and ultimately cells. Uh, so that's the basis of the work that people are doing in this area, uh, producing artificial life. So why are we interested? Um, we're interested because we don't understand what happens and it may give us uh, con some considerable insights into biology and a uh, range of other issues. Uh, where life comes from has been something which has been bothering mankind for a while. This is an axiom a Greek philosopher who suggested there was a primordial terrestrial slime and combined with the sun's heat to form life. That was to say, spontaneous generation of life from non-living systems. Uh, this idea of spontaneous generation held the field for a couple of thousand years, uh, expressed uh, considering by people like Aristotle, uh, until Pasteur came along with his famous swan neck flask experiment. I'm not going to talk about that here. I'm sure many of us have already covered this in previous studies, and if you haven't, there's plenty of information available. Uh, but essentially, uh, Pasteur falsified the idea of spontaneous generation. Life cannot generate spontaneously from non-life. That is to say, fully-fledged living systems can't develop spontaneous from their life. Hence, perhaps the ladder, uh, which is described by Operin's continuity principle, is the way to look at this thing from a, uh, a scientific perspective. Um, another problem, of course, is that uh, we live in a planet that has been teeming with life for billions of years, and if there was an abiogenic process suddenly started somewhere, it would probably be overwhelmed by the biology that already exists. Uh, Darwin spotted this uh, problem 140 years ago. Um, and he's mentioned there in a letter to Joseph Hooker. So we're unlikely to find abiogenic processes on Earth. Um, before, we get, before we get any further, I think we ought to sort of uh, clarify uh, different domains of science. Uh, the abiogenic synthesis of bio biological molecules is distinct from evolution. These are different scientific domains and shouldn't be conflated. Evolution uh, happens on populations of living systems. Uh, abiogenesis and the synthesis of biological molecules are something which happened before that, presumably. Okay, this is a, a famous experiment um, done in the 1950s. Um, Miller and Urey took a glass apparatus which they evacuated and they put in some water and some methane and some ammonia and some hydrogen and some carbon dioxide. Gases which they assumed mimicked uh, the gases, the atmosphere found on the early Earth. Uh, they heated it up to be steam, then they, they put a spark through it using the Tesla coil, which is the black object uh, disappearing off to the top right hand corner of the image. Uh, they left sparking away and boiling away for a, a day or so, and when they came back, they discovered that the colour of the solution they had originally was now pink. Uh, they did some chemical analysis and they found a range of biological materials. Um, here's a list of them and you'll notice straight away it includes some amino acids. Um, one, one point about this which is often made is that these amino acids are racemic. So for example, in the case of alanine, they got equal amounts of both D and L alanine. Uh, and a range of other biological molecules and no, that is not how you spell yield. This is taken directly from a textbook. 
Um, which just goes to show that everyone makes mistakes. Um, that work was done in 1953, which as we all know was a very good year for biology, because it was the year that Crick and Watson burst into the Eagle pub in Cambridge, announcing that they had discovered the secret of life. Uh, I mentioned this in a previous lecture, and there's a link again to the paper. Uh, it's only a single page long, basically. Uh, it's difficult to think of a single page, which is a more influence and is likely to have more influence in the future. Uh, if we do come up with rigorous models for abiogenesis, uh, they may have the, uh, a similar impact on us, uh, but perhaps more from a philosophical and practical point of view. Uh, it's been worked on uh, since Miller. Uh, Miller's work was criticised and has been criticised in that uh, the atmosphere they used probably wasn't the atmosphere of the early Earth. Uh, that's a bit sort of beside the point. What they did was demonstrate that they could produce biological materials from abiotic starting conditions. Uh, many other people have done similar work, including this key study that was published in 1961 uh, from Oro and Kimball, who were able to produce the uh, nucleotide base adenine. Um, so, a component of DNA produced under non biological conditions. Um, okay, uh, another place to look uh, we've discovered is outer space. Uh, this is a fragment of the Murchison meteorite which cross landed in Australia in 1969. Uh, when the Aussies ran up to have a look at it, they reported that it contained, it sort of smelled organic a bit tarry. Um, NASA did a chemical analysis on it shortly afterwards and discovered it contained a range of things, including amino acids. Um, when NASA did the initial uh, analysis, the, sy the system they used, they used were relatively unsophisticated compared to what we have now. And again, they found that the amino acids were racemic. Um, so equal amounts of both the D and the L antima and antimas. Uh, later on, uh, in the late 90s, people like Cronin and Pizzarello used more sophisticated tools and they discovered an, 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 an anti-amaric excess of the L was often the case. Uh, they actually found about 70 amino acids, uh, obviously which 50 of which wouldn't be involved in life in this planet. Uh, but again, the key point was they discovered a slight uh, but significant an anti-amaric excess of the L and antima. Uh, quite why this has uh, arisen is one of the great unanswered questions. Uh, here's a possible answer to it, and we have mentioned 67P Chairman of Garrisonenko before, uh, which in 2014 is going to land its Philae lander on this comet. Uh, it contains a, and the lander contains a, a range of different experiments, including one which will look at the chirality of the amino acids in the uh, comet. Um, 2014 is getting nearer. Uh, if you can't wait until then, there is the famous Lego video of the simulation of the lander, uh, which is done. Well worth having a look at, it's great fun. Okay, that's the end of part two. Uh, we'll be back later on to dig a little bit deeper into the keywords and the chemistry of this process. Okay, thanks for listening.